Hello, class. This is lecture number three for History 101. Uh, last class, we were talking about the French and Indian War. Uh, what I want to do, first of all, is sort of sum up how the French and Indian War led to the American Revolution. Uh, the French and Indian War, one of the major uh, lasting results of that war, besides eliminating the French from the North American continent, will be a gigantic debt that will overtake the British government. They form the largest army and navy known to the Western world in order to accomplish their goal of defeating the French. And they're going to have to pay this debt off. That's a result of the French and Indian War. And we'll talk about other factors of the French and Indian War leading to the Amer American Revolution in the next lecture. But our focus today is that debt. And we're moving into the next mini lecture that you'll find in Moodle on the colonial British tension. And we're going to utilize this handout right here. I gave you this handout before the midterm. It's on the flip side of the uh, century of conflict. And I've also posted a PDF of this handout uh, on the Moodle website. So you might want to print it out and have it in front of you as I deliver this lecture. We're going to go through this in detail. Now, what this handout is, basically, is a series of taxes placed on the colonists in an effort to pay off the debt incurred by the French and Indian War. Now, remember, in the beginning of the war, the colonists sort of dragged their feet because they were still mad about Louisbourg. They had the Albany Congress to try to drum up support by the colonists, but it lagged behind. Because of that, the British get the attitude that since you dragged your feet, we're handing you the bill. And also, you're the ones who benefited the most because now the French are gone and you don't have to worry about them anymore. So, they're going to pass tax after tax after tax on the colonists to pay off the debt. Now, one other thing I'd remind you of. Why do they think they can do this? Because colonies exist to serve the mother country. And if you don't want to be a colonist, pack up and move back to England and you won't pay these taxes. So the very first one you'll see on the handout is the Sugar Act. Passed shortly after French and Indian War, April of 1764. And as you can see on the provisions listed on your handout, it basically... It says revised duties, which means increased taxes on sugar, coffee, tea, other imports into the colonies from England. And remember, by this point, everything's coming from England that's sold in the colonies due to mercantilism that we explained quite some time ago. And it also expanded the jurisdiction of the vice admiralty courts. Those are the courts that punish people that the British consider to be smugglers. So, uh, this tax, the sugar tax, increased the prices of those products. Some of the colonial assemblies issued official protests, but it wasn't that big a deal. Had the British stopped their taxing of the colonists with just the Sugar Act, I'm not sure when the American Revolution would have happened. This wasn't that severe of an action on their part. But it was just the tip of the iceberg, as we'll see. The next act passed is the Stamp Act. It was passed, as you can see, on March 22nd, 1765. It created a tax on basically every printed document you can think of. Deeds, newspapers, important things like birth records, marriage licenses, even decks of cards. And what you had to do to make a deed official or a marriage license official or to sell a newspaper, you had to go to a Stamp Act tax collector, purchase the appropriate stamp, which varied in cost, and attach it to the document to make it legal or to legally sell it. Now, 
These stamps weren't that expensive, but it was sort of a situation where the colonists felt like they were being nickeled and dimed to death. Every time they turned around, there was one of these stupid stamp act tax stamps on something they were reading, filing away in their documents, or whatever. So, in response to this, the Stamp Act Congress is formed by a brand new revolutionary group that is uh, organizing in Boston. They're known as the Sons of Liberty. They're going to organize this meeting that will take place in New York City. It's an unofficial meeting. It's a meeting of rebels. And there'll be pretty good turnout. Approximately 10 out of the 13 colonies will send representatives there. Uh, they'll talk about what they should do in response to the Stamp Act. Uh, famous people like John Adams will be there, Samuel Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and so forth. And what they decide to do in protest to this is to boycott British manufactured goods. Because remember, at this point in history, the British are manufacturing everything. You can't have a factory in the colonies and selling it to the colonists at artificially high prices. British industrialists have become very dependent on this captive market that the colonies provide for them. So these very smart gentlemen, many of which are sons of liberty, decide let's hit them where it hurts in the pocketbook. So they have this very effective boycott where they're not buying anything that the British make. And it's going to work like a charm. As you'll notice in the second column, the Stamp Act will not even last one year. Parliament will re repeal it on March 18, 1766, because they feel so much pressure from British industrialists who aren't selling anything to the colonists and not making profits. So, thanks to the actions of the Sons of Liberty, the Stamp Act Congress, and this boycott, the colonists have a victory. But you'll also notice something else if you look closely at this handout. Skip down one to the Declaratory Act. You'll notice it was passed the same exact day in Parliament that the Stamp Act was repealed, March 18, 1766. In this act, basically, Parliament says to the colonists, you might have won round one. We're repealing the Stamp Act. We'll admit it was a stupid tax. Let's think about how stupid the Stamp Act was. Every time you turn around, one of these tax stamps are staring you in the face. Could you imagine if the state of New York put a tax stamp on everything that you paid 8% tax on in all stores to remind you you're paying 8% sales tax? They'd never do that. They're not foolish like Parliament. So Parliament says, we blew it. We should have never passed this law. We're repealing it. You're one round one. But guess what? We're going to pass more taxes in the future, and you're going to pay them because they're still in charge of the colonies. The colonists didn't win any political rights. They just got rid of the Stamp Act. Now, you'll notice in the colonial reaction, it was ignored in celebration over repeal the Stamp Act because here's how things would have happened back then, if you'll remember. Stamp Act was repealed March 18th. It probably took until late May before somebody came to the colonies from England and announced that the Stamp Act had been repealed. Remember, there's no TV, no radio, nothing. Somebody literally has to bring the news from England. And can you imagine somebody coming off a ship in Boston Harbor screaming at the top of their lungs that the Stamp Act was repealed, the people were all ready to celebrate. They won. That same person might have said, oh, by the way, the Declaratory Act was passed also, 
the people weren't interested in hearing about that. As far as they were concerned, they won. They beat Parliament. So, let's take a look at the next act, the Quartering Act. The Quartering Act was passed in May of 1765. Now, the Quartering Act is an interesting act because what's happening here behind the scenes and something we really haven't talked about yet, the leader of England at this point in history is King George III. His father, King George II, died during the French and Indian War, and he took over as king, and he was in his early 20s. He was a very immature king. He was in his early 20s, going on about 12 as far as he acted. He never really received any education. He resisted it. He could have went to the greatest colleges in the world. He refused. He was like a little boy king. And he acted like that. And he continually refused to release men from the British Army or the British Navy after the French and Indian War. And remember, they had built the largest army and navy known to the Western world. The reason why he refused to release these people is because in the palace he had this big giant map of the world with little toy ships and toy soldiers on it that represented British naval fleets, British battalions, and so forth. And when his advisors came in and said, Sir or Your Highness, you need to sign the discharge papers of all these different soldiers and sailors and so forth. We don't need them in the military anymore. We're not at war. We won the French and Indian War. He refused because in his childlike mind, it meant he would have to remove ships and soldiers off his little toy map that he played with constantly. So that was his rationale as to why he wouldn't release people from the military. And then he'd have fewer ships and soldiers on his little play map. But that's the truth. This guy was a wacko. So they got to come up with a way to pay at least the room and board of all these soldiers they don't even need in the military. So what do they do? They transfer them to the colonies from Europe and make the colonists pay their room and board. That's what the Quartering Act is all about. It requires, as you can see, colonists must supply British troops with housing and other items, candles, firewood, food, even their daily ration of rum that all British soldiers and sailors got on a daily basis as part of their pay. So, this was one of the most detested acts ever passed in the colonies. And it was especially unpopular in Boston. It's so unpopular that the Third Amendment in the Constitution that was passed, uh, you know, after the Revolution, and we'll be talking about that later, is devoted to make sure we never have a quartering act again in the United States. Go to the back of your book, look at the Third Amendment, read it. It basically prohibits quartering acts in the brand new United States. That's how it detested it was. The Third Amendment was written in 1790 and it was still on the minds of the former colonists. So the quartering act will be in effect and it'll have various levels that will rise and fall as more troops arrive here, depending on the whims of the king. From the time it's passed in 1765, right up to the eve of the revolution. And another uh, way that this really bothered the colonists, if British troops were out on maneuvers, let's say there's a unit that was stationed in Boston, and they're marching out into the countryside. 
They march all day and they got to camp for the night. Instead of setting up camp, the commanding officer of that group would go door to door knocking and saying, uh, here you go. Here's four or five British redcoats are going to spend the night with you tonight. You need to feed them and give them a place to sleep. Colonists hated this, especially if they were rebels. They didn't want British redcoats staying in their homes. So the Quartering Act was a highly despised act. Now, the next act that we want to get to today, uh, before we wrap up things today, is the Townsend Revenue Acts that you can see are passed on in June and July of 1767. Let me give you a little background information on how these came about. Now, remember from our previous lecture, the person who organized the successful uh, campaign of the French and Indian War for the British was William Pitt. Now, William Pitt was rewarded for this uh, successful uh, strategy. He was made prime minister. Now, he was prime minister in uh, 1767, but he fell ill. And he appointed his right-hand man to be his uh, replacement temporarily while he recovered from an illness. And that person's name was... Townsend. Now, his nickname was Champagne Charlie because he was known to like his champagne and be, uh, you know, quite a BSer at parties and so forth. So, Champagne Charlie is the acting prime minister of England. Now, what's going to happen here is he's going to have sort of a meet and greet with the members of parliament to introduce himself. Tell everybody, you know, he's standing in for William Pitt while he recovers. And at this sort of cocktail party meet and greet session, old Champagne Charlie, as in typical fashion, was sort of talking out of his hat. And he tells some key members of parliament, I've got a tax plan that is so ingenious, so brilliant, that it's going to tax the colonists and they won't even know they're being taxed. It's sort of like a secret tax, a stealth tax. And he tells his member of par parliament this story and they're all drinking champagne and carrying on. And the next couple days go by and quite frankly, uh, Townsend had completely forgotten about this. But a couple members of parliament visit his home and ask him, when can we expect the details to the plan? We're very interested in this tax. And in fact, we need it as soon as possible. Because we, in lieu of receiving your plan and anticipating how great it's going to be, we've already reduced taxes on citizens who live in England. But we need the new revenue as quickly as possible, so we need your plan. Townsend says, don't worry, I'll have it to you as soon as I can. Now he's got a scramble. He doesn't really have a plan. And what the Townsend Revenue Acts basically are, as you can see in the provisions, new duties or taxes on glass, lead, paper, paints, everything you can think of. And they're going to tighten up customs, which means they tighten up sm against smugglers. Or smugglers, as they're known back in this day and age, privateers. So, what do you think the colonial reaction to this brand new series of taxes is going to make the price of everything go through the roof is going to be? A boycott, of course. It worked with the Stamp Act. They don't even really need to hold a Townsend Revenue Act Congress. The Sons of Liberty are so organized by this point, the word gets through the grapevine. Time for a boycott. <coughs> Excuse me. So, an all-out boycott on British-made goods is undertaken by the Sons of Liberty and their auxiliary group, the Daughters of Liberty, which are the wives and daughters of these rebels, 
who really have to make this boycott work because they're the ones who have to do without everyday items like tea and other things that they're boycotting. This time, though, as you can see, it's going to be a much more prolonged boycott. It's not going to just be a matter of months. The law was packed, passed in 1767. They will not repeal it till 1770. So this was a long three-year boycott. <coughs> Excuse me. I need a drink of water. Here. But it worked. The British repealed the act. They reduce all the new taxes on everything except tea. So I've reached the 20 minute mark or so on this lecture. That's all I'm gonna to talk to you at a time because I know you'll nod off and I'm getting hoarse from talking too much as uh, you just saw. So with that subject of tea, that's where we'll pick up next class because we're gonna pick up with the Tea Act but before we cover the Tea Act, we're going to uh, cover something very important that also happened in March of 1770, besides the repeal of the Townsend Acts. That's the so-called Boston Massacre. So when I come back to the library tomorrow to lecture once again, I'm going to pick up with the Boston Massacre and the Tea Act. So bye for now. Be safe, take care, and stay home.